Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk to you about the Forge Valley Railway Line. This is a disused line that runs from Pickering in the west to Seema Station in the east, which isn't actually at Seema, but is somewhat to the south of Scarborough. There were four lines which terminated at Pickering, only one of which still remains. This is the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, which was originally known as the Whitby and Pickering Railway when it was designed by George Stevenson in 1831. It opened in 1836. Initially, the carriages were drawn by horses. The Gilling and Pickering Railway line heads west out of Pickering, passing through Kirby Moorside, Helmsley, Nunnington, before meeting up with the Thirsk to Moulton Railway line at Gilling. This is a subject of another one of my videos. Heading south is the Pickering to Moulton line, which actually connects to the York Scarborough line at Rillington, just to the northeast of Moulton. Rillington station is no longer there, but the York Scarborough line is still running. There were only two other stations on the line, one of which closed shortly after opening. Black Bull, as it came to be known, or Kirby, serving the village of Kirby Misperton, closed fairly soon after the line opened, and the other was known as Low Marishes and later Marishes Road. The track was pulled up in 1966. And so that leaves us with the Forge Valley line heading from Pickering to Seema. It's a strange name for the line since it doesn't actually pass through Forge Valley at all. But the station at West Ayton was named Forge Valley to avoid confusion with Great Ayton, which is near Middlesbrough. I won't bother to go over Pickering Station again since that's covered in the Gilling to Pickering line video. So we shall start a bit further on at Outgang Crossing. I have cycled out to Pickering and slightly beyond it. This is, uh, I have come down Outgang Lane, which comes down here, or possibly Outgang Road, and there's a, a gas works in this area. But where I'm standing, or rather probably just the other side of this fence, is where the old railway was. It goes all the way to Scarborough. Uh, well, it actually joins the route that goes between Scarborough and York, which still exists. Incidentally, just down that way, i.e. west, is Hugden Lane Farm, which I have taken a photo of. Uh, I rather suspect that would have been a, um, uh, uh, a railway building. I know there's another point where the railway crossed the road slightly to the east of here. To get to Westfield Crossing, it meant heading back to the A170, going east a bit, and then coming down Westfield Lane. Right, now we're standing a little bit to the east of where I was before, on Westfield Lane. Behind me you can see Westfield Gatehouse, which as the name suggests was a gatehouse which uh, looked after the gate across this road where it met the railway line. The railway line is over there behind me. You can see where it would have been, just down to this side here. Um, <laughs> you'll probably note a certain similarity between this gatehouse and the previous one I photographed, as in they're absolutely identical, but um, apparently they're all like this all the way to Seema. If you cross the path of the track, head south a short way, and then turn east along Broadmyres Lane, you will eventually re-cross the railway at Broadmyres Crossing. It's just possible you might spot some continuity errors here. Uh, this is quite a quick one. This is Broadmire or Broadmyres Gatehouse, which is about half a mile to the west of Thornton Le Dale Station. Uh, it's a little bit changed from the original, but still of the, much of the same style. It's been doubled in size by adding on an extension, 
Um, the railway track passed to the south of the building, which is on the right as we're looking at it. Um, so that's, that direction is west in the direction of Pickering, and that direction is east in the direction of Thornton Le Dale and ultimately Seema. Here's some pictures that don't have me in the way. Don't ask about the horse, something to do with a football match. In this picture, you can see the south side of the house. And if you go round the corner, that will lead you to Thornton Le Dale. I decided to go on a little diversion to Roxby Hall on the top of Roxby Hill, somewhat to the west of Thornton Le Dale and somewhat to the north of where the old railway line used to be. OK, you may need to use your imagination here a little bit. I'm standing on the top of Roxby Hill, which is just to the west of Thornton Le Dale. Um, this was the site of quite a large manorial house. It was built in the 13th century, but then knocked down and rebuilt in the 1560s, or somewhere between the 1540s and 1560s, by Sir Richard Cholmley. At this stage, it was big enough to hold a large family and 50 to 60 servants. So not a, an inconsequential place. Now all we see are these lumps and bumps. There is the occasional bit of stone poking through, uh, but that's all that's left. It's uh, by 1632, much of it had been demolished and uh, it had just fallen out of use. And since then, it's gradually reverted back to grassland, uh, what you see today, which is, well, it's a cow field basically, with some lumps and bumps and the occasional bit of stone in it. Hmm, I seem to have gathered quite an audience whilst shooting that last bit. Thankfully they are now on the other side of that fence. They don't seem particularly vicious, but I'm not taking any chances. They ignored me for a long time and then suddenly one of them plucked up courage and came to look for me. And next thing I know I'm walking through a huge crowd of them. Oh, the perils of public footpaths. Well, never mind. I think it's going to rain again in a minute, so I better shut this down. Next up is Thornton Le Dale Station. Thornton Le Dale was always a popular tourist destination, even before the railways came, and it still is. Okay, here we are in Thornton Le Dale. As you can see, even on a relatively dull day in June, it's uh, still very popular with the tourists. Fucking, I'm standing at the bus stop by the town cross, by the way. That's uh, Ward Hill Brothers over there, which has been here forever. And that is the town cross, which you probably won't be able to see because it's too dark. So let me do something about that. It's over there. Hello, I'm currently standing on a bridge on the A170 that crosses over Thornton Beck and Thornton Le Dale. In front of you, you can see a cottage, which is one of the most photographed sites in Thornton Le Dale, if not the whole of North Yorkshire. Interestingly enough, however, uh, Thornton Beck passes under this bridge, passes under the buildings on the other side of the road, and heads south, eventually passing underneath Thornton Le Dale station, as well as the gatehouse, the platform, and a section of the goods yard, as I will demonstrate. To get to the old station, you need to head south from the centre of town, down Malton Gate, presumably so named because it heads off in the general direction of Malton, one of the largest towns in the area, which is still served by a railway. There are a number of interesting buildings, including an inordinate number of cottages with colourful flowers growing on the walls. In these pictures, you can see at least one branch of Thornton Beck running down the side of the road. And then you come to the station. That is Thornton Le Dale Station, otherwise known as the Overbrook K1. 
campsite. You can stay there if you want to. Here is the station. This view is of the north facing side of the building facing away from the railway line and Thornton Lane is on the right of this picture. This is looking down the north side of the building towards Thornton Lane and this is the other side of the building where you can quite clearly see the platform. Now let's add some greenery. That's better. On the other side of the tracks, on the south side and running parallel to the tracks, is a long driveway that leads to a gatehouse. Luckily, there is a public footpath running parallel to the driveway behind a high hedge. What you're looking at here is Thornton Beck Bridge. Thornton Beck is the same beck that flows past the famous thatch cottage in Thornton le Dale that is uh, much photographed. The beck flows directly underneath the station. It's a good length, it carries the railway, the platform, the driveway to the gatehouse and the yard at the back of the station building. Over here you can probably see what remains of the gatehouse itself. That is it there. The driveway to this house is over here, over the beck on the bridge and then to the left of that would be the track and on the other side of the track is the station platform. To reach this bridge you have to go north a bit from Thornton Le Dale station then turn right and head east along a public footpath crossing a few fields before rejoining the course of the railway at a bridge that would have carried the railway over it. Hello, I am standing just in front of the Forge Valley Railway at a field access bridge uh, just to the east of Thornton the Dale Station by a little way. Uh, that's over there. Uh, it's a small red brick bridge uh, built to take the railway over the top and allow farmers access in and out of the fields. Um, it's not too bad condition, it looks like it wouldn't take much to put it back, although I imagine you might have trouble getting farm machinery through here nowadays. Um, some of the bricks have been uh, removed or fallen out, but uh, otherwise it's not too bad a condition. Uh, this is the, that's south that way, so you're looking at the south side of the railway. Um, that way is Longlands Lane. There's another bridge there that carries the road over the, where the railway would have been, although it seems to have been somewhat filled in now and you wouldn't get a train underneath that bridge. Um, and on the eastern side of Longlands Lane, the uh, cutting there has been filled in quite a lot as well, so uh, quite a lot of changes there. This is heading in the direction of Longlands Lane uh, to the east of here. If I turn around and adjust the brightness a bit, that's the direction of Thornton Dale Station and you may be able to see a few sheep there, especially if I zoom in Gosh, serious video. Ooh, that's very dark. But there are some sheep there, honestly. Yeah, that's as bright as I'm going to get it, I'm afraid. And finally, here's a couple of views from the other side of the bridge. That is to say, from the north. Bit of a digression, but if you make it up to Longlands Lane, which is just to the east of the bridge, and then head north towards the A170 and take a left onto Peaslands Lane, you will eventually come to a house that has a model village in its front garden. It is a true work of art and I really cannot understand why the owner doesn't charge people to come and view it.
To get to the bridge on Longlands Lane, simply walk southeast until you meet the road and then head back up the road a bit. Now we are a little to the east of Thornton Le Dale on Longlands Lane on what was clearly once a fairly impressive bridge but it's now a pile of rubble largely although you can still see the the edging here but I imagine that pile over there was all once bridge uh, unfortunately you can't really get a good look of what's underneath the bridge and it may have been filled in a bit um, but you can more or less make out the path of where the railway went uh, let me demonstrate Right, if one looks in the other direction, over the bridge, you can see that that uh, bushy bit in the distance. That is where the railway is. You may be able to make it out, but where those sheep are, the ground rises a bit and there's a bit of an embankment. So that would, that would have gone more or less straight to Thornton Ladale Station. Um, I don't know if I can get a better view of this bridge, but I will have a go. With the help of a tripod and a camera with a self-timer, I was able to get a decent picture of the bridge, and it's rather more impressive than I thought. Although clearly you wouldn't be able to get any kind of a railway engine underneath that bridge now. I think what has happened is that there's a cutting that used to be to the east of this bridge, and rubble has been used to fill that in. Although the next railway crossing is only across one field, you have to go back up Longlands Lane and then come down Hurrell Lane, where you'll come to the site of Hurrell Lane Bridge. Walking down from the north towards it, you can see the line of the railway since there's quite a large embankment and they've had to cut through it to allow access to fields. Right, now we are at what is described on the map as Hurrell Lane Bridge, uh, which is only really one field away to the east of the last bridge that you saw. Uh, all that's left now is that embankment over there I believe it was demolished because there wasn't enough headroom for some of the larger tractors and things to get through and it was becoming a bit of a nuisance. It wasn't big enough apparently and, uh, and they demolished it. Uh, I believe it wasn't uh, demolished all that long ago but I shall have to check my sources. Uh, whilst we're at it I might as well show you the other side. Right. If we go over here so there's the that's on the western side and this is it facing east. Now for a bit of a diversion. I decided I would go and have a look at what remains of Wilton Hall. It's nothing to do with the railways but it's not that far away from it and I was passing by anyway so I thought I'd have a look. Wilton is a small village that lies on the main A170 route from Pickering to Scarborough, roughly midway between Thornton Le Dale and Ebbeston. Let's start at the old forge B&B, &B, which seems to get good reviews. Then you can head south down Corcliffe Lane, which runs through the centre of the village, past some rather splendid houses, until eventually you get to St George's Church. However, just to the left of it are the remains of Wilton Hall and the moat that surrounds it. Hello, and I have come to Wilton. Behind me is St George's Church, which is an early 20th century building, but it was built on the site of an earlier um, Chapel of Ease, uh, and there are some uh, 13th century uh, monuments and a Norman tub font within the building um, but I'm actually currently standing on the edge of the ditch that surrounds Wilton Hall. Uh, Wilton Hall uh, was a 
12th century fortified manor, possibly even earlier, and uh, it's uh, surrounded by a moat. Uh, some debate as to whether the moat was uh, merely decorative or a status symbol or actually helped uh, to fortify the manor. The manor survived until the Civil War, which was 1642 to 1651, and um, then unfortunately it was slighted, as in uh, put beyond use, in much the same way that Helmsley Castle was. Helmsley Castle has a big hole in the, uh, in the tower that you can see walking up from the town. Uh, Wilton Hall is a, uh, one of a series of uh, castles and fortified manors along the uh, northern edge of the Vale of Pickering, or to put it another way, the southern edge of the North Yorkshire Moors National Park. Um, this is uh, apparently, although there's a, this is one of the better examples apparently, there's not a huge amount to see, uh, but there you can see some stone poking through uh, the inside, uh, the, the platform if you like, inside the moat. Uh, and somewhere apparently there was meant to be a fairly substantial tower, but there's uh, nothing really above ground anymore. There are also a great deal of sheep and horses in this field. Um, I came up on, on the edge of this mound to prevent the horses uh, intervening. They're convinced they can eat this tripod, but um, it seems to have stopped them. Back to the railway. If one follows the road round the eastern side of Wilton Hall, it starts heading south and becomes Cliff Lane. Where it meets the railway is Wilton Car Crossing and the accompanying gatehouse. Okay, I've uh, come down from Wilton, which is up there to the north, and I'm now standing on where the Forge Valley Railway would have been. This is it behind me. That's heading off in the direction of Thornton Ladale. If I turn the camera around in a minute, I will point it at what is called Wilton Gatehouse, or according to the map, Wilton Car House. Uh, this is where the original gatehouse was, but it is not the original gatehouse, although apparently it has been rebuilt uh, with some of the bricks from the original one, which was demolished in 2002. The last resident in this house before it was demolished was one Deggy Bond who moved into a care home in Thornton Le Dale in 2002. His mother was the gatehouse keeper and was responsible for opening the gates. Strangely enough, uh, Wilton never actually had a station, although there was a station called Wilton. The Wilton station was actually at Alliston. Um, and then eventually it was renamed Ebberston, despite the fact Ebberston is even further away from um, the station than Wilton is. The station was renamed because another station opened somewhere, I'm not quite sure where, which was also called Wilton, and they didn't want any confusion. Carrying on south down the hill, away from the railway, you eventually come to the appropriately named Lane End Farm. If you then turn left along Wilton Ings Lane and then Malton Lane, you're on a track that converges with the railway until the road meets the railway at a point just south of Alliston, where there is another crossing keeper's cottage. This one was once responsible for operating the gates over Alliston Lane and painted a fetching shade of white. Now I'm at Alliston. Uh, confusingly enough, the station behind me is actually called Ebberston. And even more confusingly, it used to be called Wilton. On the 1st of April 1903, um, it was renamed Ebberston to avoid confusion with another station also called Wilton. Now, I'm not sure where this station would have been. Uh, there is a Wilton in Wiltshire, not far from Salisbury, and it's had a number of stations, but I can't see how that could have been a problem because they'd been around since the 1850s and they didn't change the name since until 1903. So 
that doesn't really make sense. Uh, it was actually built here because when the railway was first built, the landowner was not in favour of the railway and would not allow them to build it in Alliston, which is in that direction up to the north. Uh, over in that direction, to the east, is Ebberston, despite this being called Ebberston Station. And over in that direction, to the west, is uh, Wilton, which is uh, actually slightly nearer than Ebberston. Why they didn't call it Alliston, I don't know. OK, that's the road heading off to the south. That's the road heading off in the direction of Wilton. And this is the gatehouse. Now, this is the original gatehouse. And you can see the railway went just to the right of it, where you can still see the platforms of the station on the other side, and the gate, and the camping carriages, which have uh, been put there. That's uh, quite a piece of work that they had to actually relay some of the track before they could uh, put the uh, carriages on them. But you can stay there, there are, they are guest houses. Uh, the gatehouse, as I say, is original, but there has been an extension added to it uh, just to the right of that chimney over in the direction of the railway. But otherwise, it's much the same. As you can see, this one is white. Presumably, it's the same red brick underneath as all the other gatehouses on the Forge Valley line. And if we go this way, that's the road up to Alliston and the entrance to the... Uh, to the station is on the left and carry around this way this is Penniston Lane and this heads off to the east and that's where I'm going next actually on further investigation I have discovered why they didn't call it Alliston and yes you've guessed it there was already another station called Alliston. Anyway, I thought I'd let you have a closer look at the station. If you go north, just past the sign that says Alliston, on the left, there is an entrance to the station with a rather nice sign outside it. By the way, I am not sponsored by the old station at Alliston. Inside you can see the station building, which looks remarkably like the one at Thornton the Dale, and in the distance you can just make out the camping carriages on the short stretch of track. There is also a way house. Note the stone bollard to the left of the way house. There's another one like this in Brompton. I was told by the owner of ISM Engineering, which is housed in an old railway goods shed, that these were used as boundary markers to show the edge of railway land. You can see that the deck of the way bridge is still present, although I rather think the aerial and the security light are modern additions. From Ebberston Station, which is south of Alliston, you can take Penniston Lane until you get to just south of Ebberston. If you then turn right, in front of you, you will see the Ebberston Crossing and the gatehouse beside it, guarding the B1258. This gatehouse and crossing is about a mile to the east of Ebberston Station and directly south of Ebberston Village. In 1951, new residents moved in, shortly after the line had closed, but before the tracks were lifted. At the time, there was no running water, only a well and a pump in the garden. Coal house, wash house and outside toilet can be found outside in sheds. Judging by maps and overhead views, it looks as though the railway tracks passed slightly to the north of the building. Ings Lane Gatehouse lies about a half a mile to the east of Ebberston Gatehouse. OK, this is a quick one. This is the Ings Lane crossing and that's the gatekeeper's house over there, which hasn't been modified particularly much. You can see we're back to red bricks now, none of this white watch nonsense. Uh, about half a mile that way, which is to the west, is the Ebberston crossing, which is where Ebberston station should be, but isn't. 
The building has had an extension added on, but is otherwise unchanged. The track ran to the north of the building, and you can clearly see the path of the track if you stand just to the north of the house and look east. If you look the other way, there's a gap in the hedge, but no obvious sign of the track. To get to the next gatehouse, you have to rejoin the A170, then head south down minor roads through Snainton before heading west parallel to the railway track until you reach Foulbridge Lane crossing. This is Foulbridge Lane crossing and the gatehouse is over there. Um, you can see the dark green gate just to the right is where the railway would have been, uh, that's to say to the north of the gatehouse. Um, immediately after crossing the road, the head shunts for the goods yards of Snayton Station would have started spreading out. It's really not very far away from the station at all. Um, this uh, gatehouse was operated uh, in a way that was common to many gatehouses along the line. That is to say, the man of the house was a plate layer and was responsible for maintaining the line in the area, whereas his wife was responsible for operating the gates whenever a train came through. This is a view from the southern side of the building. You can see that it's been painted white and has been extended. Behind the building, that's to say to the north, is the railway track, and to the right, which is to the east, is Snainton Station, not very far at all. Snainton Station is now home to Station Garage. I'm not sure how much of the building is actually used. Uh, this entrance is somewhat to the west of the main station building. Behind me you can see Snainton Station. This was the largest and most popular station on the line. It had two platforms and two unusual additions, one of which was a greenhouse on the platform and the other was a hippopotamus skull. When the line closed in 1950, the skull was presented to a signalman at Ravenscar, but has since disappeared. Uh, there are two crossings, one on Middle Lane, heading south uh, on the east side of the station, and another one on Foulbridge Lane, which is just over there. There was also a brickworks to the south of the station, which was used to manufacture many of the bricks which were used in the stations and gatehouses up and down the length of the Forge Valley line. Looking at this picture, it appears that the main station building has been converted into two separate residences, each of which has its own blue front door. Judging by a photo taken in 1995, it seems station garage was a bit more extensive. It had uh, a petrol pump in front of the main station building and the right hand side of the ground floor uh, seemed to have a plate glass window in it which might explain why the bricks are a slightly different colour in that area. And this photo shows a slightly wider view showing more of the extent of the buildings although I believe they go on even further to the west. This may be part of the goods yard. I couldn't really get a clear view of the southern side of the station with the platform on it as it was blocked by these two large trees. This is Middle Lane on the eastern end of the station. There was a crossing here but as far as I can tell no gatehouse. It was probably incorporated into the station itself. This is a view looking more or less south down Middle Lane, a little to the south of where the railway track would have been. Middle Lane continues on until it gets near to the River Derwent where it stops, as there is no bridge over the river. However, if you stand at the northeast corner of the station and look to the east along Green Lane, you will see a track that follows a path slightly to the north of where the railway track would have been. However, take care, it would seem Green Lane is open to motor vehicles. At this point, I thought I'd take some time off 
and photograph some of the more interesting buildings around Snainton, including the Peacock Pub, the Reading Room, and the 128 Bus, which is the only means of public transport which will get you from Pickering to Scarborough these days, unless you count taxis, and also this thatched cottage and a war memorial. But then I realised I'd forgotten something. To get to Barker's Lane crossing from the A170, you can simply walk south down Barker's Lane along the edge of the cricket pitch. Alternatively, if you're at Snainton Station, you can simply follow Green Lane. This is Barker's Lane Gatehouse. I can tell this because the sign outside says The Gatehouse. The railway would have passed to the right of this picture, just beyond that wooden fence and just to the south of Green Lane. The house has been much modified and painted white, but it's still just about recognisable as a gatehouse. You can get from the Barker's Lane crossing to Brompton by Sawdon by walking south down Barker's Lane and then heading more or less east along Brompton Car Lane. If you do this, you would pass over the path of the railway at Brompton Car Crossing with its associated gatehouse. Unfortunately, this was demolished in 2013 and replaced with another building, so I didn't bother to visit. Instead, I headed south from the A170 and then east along Church Lane until I came to All Saints Church. Today I'm in Brompton by Sawdon. This is sometimes known as the birthplace of aviation because Sir George Cayley was born here, who was a pioneer in aviation and is supposed to have built the first um, workable glider. He also developed the main principles of flight in a modern aeroplane, that's to say thrust, drag, weight and lift, and was also responsible for designing the first cambered wing. I'm not entirely sure where Brompton Hall is. Which is where George Cayley was brought up. But uh, Brompton Hall School is just down the road from this church down there. Um, and he was buried in the churchyard of this church. This is All Saints Church, Brompton. Not sure where his grave is, but I'm going to try and have a look anyway. So wish me luck. Well, I had a pretty good look and I found quite a lot of Cayley graves up the western end of the graveyard, but no George Cayley, 6th Baronet of Brompton. I did, however, find the 9th Baronet's grave he was a captain in the Royal Defence Corps and died in 1917, so possibly fighting during the First World War. But then I was lucky enough to bump into the author of this book, available in all good bookshops and some bad ones as well. And she told me that George Cayley, 6th Baronet of Brompton, is buried in the crypt underneath the church, but there is no way in. But she was kind enough to let me have a quick look round the church and there's some rather splendid stained glass in there so it wasn't a totally wasted trip. On leaving the church I headed east and then south in the direction of the railway station and the gatehouse. Passing through Brompton by Sawdon as I did so. Today I'm in Brompton, but strangely enough the station behind me was actually called Sawdon. Uh, strictly speaking, the town is actually Brompton by Sawdon, um, but most people refer to it as Brompton. They didn't call it Brompton because apparently there's another station near North Allerton called Brompton, and they didn't want there to be any confusion. Um, behind me is the main station house. Uh, the passenger platform would have been on this side. Uh, there were other sidings and platforms behind the building which led to goods sheds, 
Uh, there was a weigh house and a one ton crane. Unfortunately, they've been demolished. Um, but one of the goods sheds is now being used by a local business who does welding work and the like. Um, the station itself has been converted into holiday cottages. Just out of the picture, I don't think you'll be able to see it, but on this side um, is a, a gatehouse, uh, which is uh, another red brick one. Um, hasn't changed that much apart from a small extension on the north side, that's to say the side, the other side, um, which has a garage in it. Um, that's extending over where the track would have been. In other words, the gatehouse is on the southern side of the track. The station is on the northern side of the track. Um, on the other side of the road, where the railway would have gone, is a new building which hasn't doesn't even appear on Google Maps yet, um, which is uh, a rather odd looking thing, rather strange blocky construction. I was just talking to the chap who wondered what I was doing, taking photos of his business. He has the business that uses the old good shed, and he was saying that uh, he originally um, asked for planning permission to build a traditional stone cottage type thing, but he was turned down. He said um, he had to build a commercial property because, because I, I don't know, because the, there's another commercial property on there. Who knows, anyway. So he had to build that funny looking thing. Apparently it's very nice inside and very well put together, but uh, it does look a little bit incongruous from the outside. Anyway, enough waffling. I shall carry on in the direction of Wycombe Hall and then I shall cross over the A170 uh, in much the same way as the railway did. Uh, but in the meantime, I shall do my... Well, I'll pan around a bit and show you what's here. Okay. So that's the... Uh, I think they call that Ings Lane, which is heading south out of uh, Brompton. I'm actually standing on the edge of a cricket pitch and that's a, a building related to the cricket pitch. Now that's the rather strange modern building that would have, uh, that lies where the railway would have been on the uh, western side of the road and if I keep panning around um, then you will see, right that's the gatehouse uh, hasn't changed a great deal, as I say. There's a, um, a garage on the northern side, on the, uh, on the side where the railway -like track would have been. And if I keep going around... Right, now we're starting to see the station building. That's the station building. This is now holiday cottages, um, which you can rent out. Um, and then it continues on here. Uh, or cricket paraphernalia. Not sure if any of these buildings have anything to do with the railway. That possibly, no, I don't think that shed on the other side was. I shall be walking around the back of these and there's a footpath which should end up somewhere over in the direction I'm pointing. And if you carry on over the fields in, well, in that direction, you should get to Wycombe Hall, uh, or is it Wycombe Abbey? But apparently there used to be a nunnery there. And yeah, that's the direction I shall be going. And that's some sort of a crickety clubhouse. Before I leave Brompton by Sorden, I should just mention this boundary bollard. It's just like the one at Eberston Station I mentioned earlier and lies a little to the north of the railway station. I'm told it marks the edge of railway land. To get to what was once quite a major crossing, the railway heads northeast at this point. I have to take a more circuitous route. Hello, I, uh, I hope you can hear me above the sound of the traffic. I'm standing on the A170 at a point called Gallows Hill. Uh, why, I hear you ask, am I showing you a stretch of busy A-road? 
Well, you may find it hard to believe, but this flat stretch of road you see behind me was not always this way. At one time, the uh, Forge Valley Railway crossed the road at this point, or I should say the road crossed it because the railway came up from that direction, which is sort of southeast in the direction of Brompton, uh, and, it, and it came up here, and then there was a road bridge that went over the top. Uh, so, I don't know, a humpback bridge, maybe something a bit more gentle than that, actually passed over the top of the railway. Um, I can't see any sign of it now. However, this little minor road here is called Gallows Hill Lane, and that follows the path of the railway for a short distance. And you can see where the railway was by looking at the hedges on either side of the road. Uh, on that side and over there on the north side it uh, curbs around uh, in the direction of Ruston um, which is a, a little way to the east of here. Um, the Forge Valley line was closed down in 1950 uh, but the road bridge that was here survived up until 1966 uh, when it was demolished and then the road was raised in order to make it nice and flat. Presumably the, the railway track was in a bit of a cutting, um, so there would have been a, a dip and uh, which lessened the height of the bridge for the road, presumably. And uh, when they demolished the bridge, they had to fill in that cutting to make the road nice and level, I guess. I haven't actually seen any photographs of the Gallows Hill Bridge, but uh, that's my assumption anyway. Okay, I'll just do my 360 degrees. Uh, that is the road heading west uh, in the direction of Pickering and lots of other places. Um, this is about the point where the railway would have come across. Uh, looking at those trees, that uh, is probably where the hedges came out. So that must be the line of the railway, I would think. Uh, turn around a bit more. Oops. Right, that's the road heading east towards Scarborough. Uh, Ruston uh, is, uh, there's a turning on the left which is probably just out of view. And this rather dark lane is Gallows Hill Lane. Brighten it up for you. Yeah. That's Gallows Hill Lane, uh, which more or less for a very short moment up to about that gate uh, follows the line of the railway. I said that I didn't have any photos of Gallows Hill Bridge. That isn't quite true. If we zoom in on this photo of Gallows Hill Lane, look at that gate. Now compare this photo with this old photo taken from Gallows Hill Bridge. I think that's the same stretch of lane. And if we compare it with this photo taken from where that gate is, I think you can see the same line of hedge that heads off in the direction of Ruston. And you can see that the trees have grown a lot taller on the horizon. If you still can't get your bearings, and I'm not sure I've got this right, this photo is taken above the path of the modern A170 on the road bridge that went over the railway, looking roughly northeast. And the railway is curving off into the distance, and I would think Ruston is just over the horizon. That stonework on the far right hand side of the photograph is the closest thing I've got to a photograph of Gallows Hill Bridge, which is odd because it wasn't demolished until 1966 and I would have thought there were plenty of cameras around. So next it's back the way I came and then turn left to head into Ruston.
No station, no gatehouses, but one massive bridge. Right, I am now in Ruston, to be more precise, Ruston Westgate. Behind me, we can see all the remains of a bridge that carried the railway through Ruston. Over there, that red brick structure, you can see it's built up behind it. So I guess there must have been a bridge that carried on over here. Over there is Westgate and there's another abutment over there. So I guess it must have cut, I don't know exactly what it happened, but looking around here, I can see quite a lot of brickwork, which looks like it might have supported something, but obviously it's changed quite a lot and it's uh, uh, a lot lower than it used to be. But uh, that used to be a bridge that carried the railway through Ruston. Okay, so that's uh, the bridge abutment on the west side of uh, Westgate in Ruston. If I turn round, that's heading into the centre of town. Still catch a bus there even. Shame you can't catch a train. Now, if I turn round, now you can see, if you look uh, down here into the stream, there's evidence of brickwork. So I don't know if that held at the bridge. The bridge must have gone over there. I don't know exactly how long it was, but uh, on the other side of those sheds is Eastgate, and I believe there's another abutment there. So I shall go and have a look for that. Right, I am now at the corresponding bit on Eastgate, no more than a few tens of metres away from the, uh, the other bridge abutment. More red bricks. This must be where the, uh, the bridge came out uh, on the other side. That's to say, this is Eastgate. The last one was Westgate. Um, probably a lot lower than it used to be. Uh, I shall um, turn around and show you the other side because the ground is a bit higher there and there seems to be a bit more of an abutment left and there's a public footpath so I might climb up there and have a look. Uh, this is the eastern side of Eastgate. As you can see, it's quite built up. And also there's evidence of red brick down there. So this must have been where the bridge came down on the east side of Eastgate. So the railway would have been going more or less above my head, as far as I can make out. Okay, I've uh, climbed up on the uh, embankment, uh, on the railway in effect on the uh, eastern side of Eastgate in Ruston and I'm looking west uh, so you can see the layout of things. Um, the, that yurt thing, or um, you can't see Eastgate, it's between the yurt and this embankment that I'm standing on, uh, but in the distance you can see Westgate and you can see the brick embankment where the bridge came from, so it would have come from all the way over there to where I am now and the railway would have gone straight through here. So if I pan around, right, that's uh, looking sort of southeast in, uh, in the direction of uh, the centre of Ruston and also the A170. Keep going around. Now, this apparently is a public footpath, but not according to my map, it may be out of date, but that is the course of the railway. It must be because this is where the bridge touched down. So if I, f if I go this away, follow this path, I should end up somewhere by the down arms and I believe there's another bridge. But I hear you say, this is all very well. But where's your hard evidence? All I've seen is a few piles of bricks by the side of the road. Well, I must admit, I did struggle to find any hard evidence that there'd ever been a bridge passing over Ruston. But take a look at this picture taken from Google Street View. Thank you, Google. Now compare it with this one. I haven't quite got the same angle, but if you look behind the enormous horse, not only is that the same building, but behind that, there appears to be a bridge over the road. That, I would suggest, is the railway track. If you go back to the modern picture, I'm suggesting the bridge is where those red bricks are on the left, and where the embankment is on the right. 
Thank you very much to Robin Lidster and the Wycombe, Ruston and Northmore Village Archive for this photograph. Well, the road to Wycombe Lane Bridge is pretty straightforward. Just follow the path of the old railway line, which turns out to be a permissive path. I am now standing in front of Wycombe Bridge. Uh, this is just to the west of Wycombe Station, which I have not yet visited. Uh, that's behind me. And uh, in the western direction is Ruston. I've just walked along the footpath that comes through the cutting that the railway went along. Um, and I'm now standing on the railway. The railway would have gone under the bridge, obviously. And uh, Wycombe Bridge is still very much an active bridge. There is a minor road that goes over the top. Uh, this, of course, is the um, western facing side. Um, You may notice it's quite a quite a wide arch. Um, the reason for this is they were thinking ahead, and uh, it's implied that the track was only a single track at this point. Um, but they were thinking ahead at that in possibly in the future there would have been another track. So they made the bridges wide enough to span two tracks. Uh, this is uh, something they did quite a lot of uh, uh, in my other video for the Gilling to Pickering line. At the point where the Gilling to Pickering line starts, um, there are actually two tracks running parallel to each other, heading east for a fair distance before it turns away. Now, they did this for reasons of cost because it meant that they, they could just have um, sidings at Gilling and you'd get onto the right track uh, early, so to speak, before you went further east and uh, you wouldn't need to build points at the point where the track headed off north to Nunnington and Helmsley. Um, so they wouldn't have been able to do this if they'd only purchased enough land for a single track, but they, they purchased enough for two. Two tracks were never built, as in one track in either direction, so they used the extra space to put in another track in parallel to the other one, um, so they could... Uh, turn off north to go to Nunnington with a minimum of cost, save putting in points, saved employing people, signal men to uh, operate them. Anyway, that's a bit of a digression. I shall uh, take some snaps and go and look at the other side of the bridge, which I imagine is much the same, only in more shadow. Yes, that about sums it up. Keep heading east along the line of the old railway line and before long you come to Wycombe Station. The first thing you see is the edge of the platform, a little overgrown but in pretty good condition. Then you can follow the track right past the station building, making chuff chuff and woo woo noises if you want to. The station building is now used as the estate office for the Dornay Estates. They own a lot of land and businesses around Wycombe and also around Danby, which is some 35 miles away on the North York Moors. If you walk round the western end of the station building, you can see the southern side of the station facing south, although strictly speaking this is private property. You can see that the design is very much like the other stations on the line although this one seems in particularly good condition. OK, I have made it to Wycombe Station, which is behind me. Uh, this is the side opposite the platform. The platform was on the other side. Uh, the railway track um, heads west towards uh, Ruston and east, where it shortly recrosses the A170 and heads towards west and east Ayton. This is the only station on the line that never had a gatehouse. Um, it also only had two sidings, one of which had a two-ton crane. Like so many stations on this line, it changed its name. It was originally called Ruston Station. Ruston is in fact not very far away to the west of here. Nearer the road can be found the small way office. 
This is very similar to the one at Eberston Station, although the Weybridge plate is missing. Having gone to all that trouble to reach the north side of the A178 Gallows Hill, the railway then decides after Wycombe to head back to the south side of the A170 at Fothill Bridge, or possibly Fot Hill, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I am now at the location of what used to be Fot Hill Bridge, which took the railway over the A170. Fot Hill Bridge had brick abutments and an iron girder construction. Uh, unlike the bridge at uh, Gallows Hill, um, this was demolished uh, two years after the line was closed in 1950. And when they did that, they also cut back the abutments on both sides uh, to give motorists a better view. Uh, you can see over on the other side of the road, beside that water park sign, uh, that's the abutment for the bridge. Uh, where I am standing is roughly where the bridge would have touched down. I think it's actually slightly to my right, um, but it, it's about the same place. Um, this was at the junction of uh, Fothill Lane and Sandy Bed Lane, apparently. And still is. Fothill or Fothill Lane heads north of the A170 to Hutton Bustle, whereas Sandy Bed Lane, uh, which is little more than a track, head south of the A170. West Bulk Bridge is a field access bridge slightly to the east of Fothill Bridge. This is West Bulk Bridge, B-A-L-K. It is immediately east of Fothill Bridge and provides field access underneath the railway visible from the A170 main road. Strikes me this is rather similar to the access bridge um, just to the east of Thornton Ladale railway station. Only of course this one is actually intact. Um, if I uh, pan a bit you can see the embankment that the railway used to run along quite clearly. This is heading towards Fothill Bridge, where it uh, used to go over the A170. We go the other way. Bridge. And it heads off this way. Now, somewhere over there, there used to be another bridge, but I believe it's been demolished now, but I shall go and have a look anyway. The site of Church Lane Bridge is just a little way to the east along the A170 and then right down Church Lane. Here's a clearer view of the railway embankment between Church Lane and Fothill Bridge. You can see where the A170 is by the position of that white van. However, when it reaches Church Lane, it suddenly stops. I'm now on Church Lane, which is a little to the south of the A170. And behind me, you can see the embankment for the bridge that originally went over Church Lane. The, uh, the embankment continues in the direction of Fothill Bridge and also passes over a field access bridge. The bridge has long gone and indeed the abutment on the other side has completely disappeared as well. Um, if you like, I'll turn the camera around and show you, but there's not very much to see as you can imagine. At Church Lane. And that's where the abutment for the other side of the bridge should be, but isn't. That's Church Lane heading south.
To reach Forge Valley Station, you need to head for West Dayton. Go back north up Church Lane, turn right onto the A170, then it's a bit of a stretch until you get to West Dayton, where you should turn right onto Garth End Road, head south, and the station will be on your right, slightly set back from the road. Now I am in West Ayton, uh, West Ayton because it's to the west of the River Derwent and East Ayton is just to the east of the River Derwent. This station is on the western side so therefore it's in West Ayton. So you might think the logical thing to do would be to call this station West Ayton. Ah, oh no, it's actually called Forge Valley. It's presumably not called West Ayton to avoid confusion with Great Ayton, which is near Middlesbrough. Uh, so they called it Forge Valley. Uh, it's not actually in Forge Valley, but it is near it. Forge Valley heads up to the north here and the River Derwent runs through it. Um, this is, uh, used to be a, a council depot uh, for, you know, gritting the roads and that sort of thing. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be now. It seems a little worse for wear and I believe the council are trying to sell it but I believe the building does have some protection. This was a reasonably important station. It has the largest goods shed on the line which is still there just over there. Uh, I shall have to dig out my big lens for that one. Um, and uh, it also had a sheep dock and there was a timber yard with its own siding. This station also has its own gatehouse uh, not far from the station. Uh, it's, in fact, it's just over there. That's a uh, uh, private residence now. It was also known as the Porter's House, so it seems the staff uh, also lived there for some of the time. A little to the east of here is another gatehouse, this one called Derwent Crossing, um, and it's where the railway comes in from the south and curves around into East Ayton. Um, it's much modified but it's, it's still there. There's a, a well in the garden as well, which is probably built by the railway. The crossing at Derwent Crossing apparently had extremely long gates, probably the longest on the line, because the angle between the railway and the road was very small. Therefore, you needed large gates in order to uh, bridge the gap, because you're on a diagonal, so to speak. The Hart family lived at Derwent Crossing for many years, in fact, until 1972. In 1928, Ethel Hart was born there, but her mother was already the uh, gatekeeper and her father was a plate layer. Apparently somewhere there's Derwent Bridge, which carried the track over the River Derwent. There's very little left, but apparently it was an iron girder bridge and the easternmost part of it is still there. Well, I haven't found it yet. However, Ian Smith has also made a YouTube video covering this area and he managed to find the Derwent Bridge. So if you're interested, go and look there. I'll try and put a link in the uh, information for this video. Hello, I've just walked through the village of Burton, which is over that away, and then I headed uh, west. And when the village starts to run out, you come to Erton Waterworks, part of which is behind me. This opened in 1884, only two years after the Forge Valley Railway was opened. It had its uh, very own siding, uh, which led to a coal reception building, as it was called. And uh, presumably the coal was used to power the pumps. Uh, the uh, beam engine pumps remained until the 1930s when a new borehole was drilled and the pumps were replaced with electric ones but it's still the same building in fact there are a number of buildings that's just the most prominent one um, also to my right uh, is the path of the Forge Valley Railway and there is another gatekeeper's cottage um, Presumably the road at one time went a bit further on because the road I'm on finishes beside the cottage at the moment so there isn't really much uh, of a gate to be kept even the railway was there but anyway I shall uh, take a few more snaps and see how we go. 
As you head towards the western side of Erton, the first sign of the waterworks is this sign on a wall. It's beside a gate and inside you can see a smaller building constructed in a similar style to the larger one which is a few hundred yards down the road. There is some more modern equipment to the west of the older buildings. This would be put in as part of the 2017 upgrade which aims to remove pesticides and adjust the pH of the water. I should have taken some photos really. On the other side of the road is the gatehouse. Here are some photographs of the gatekeeper's cottage. I think I've solved the mystery as to what it is you're actually crossing. The railway would have passed immediately to the right of this house, about where that wooden fence is. Actually, I think it's a gate. It certainly used to be, judging from photographs taken in the mid-90s. Now, the street running in front of the house is Main Street, but after the railway was crossed, the path then heads more or less south along Goose Mire Lane, at least that's what it's called on Google Maps, but other references refer to it as Goose Lane, and this would be the Goose Lane crossing. The cottage remains remarkably unchanged, apart from the aerial on the roof and the double glazing. If you head east back up Main Street, you'll come to Ayton Road. If you then head southeast past a roundabout, you will come to Seema. Seema seems to be pretty well provided with pubs. Eventually you will pass St Martin's Church and then in a field immediately afterwards you will find Manor Garth and the remains of a manor house. It could do with a little work. Hello again, it's me. This apparently is Manor Garth, uh, which is just outside the village of Burton. Well, it's almost in it really, it's just behind the church. Uh, I think this is pretty much all there is left to see of it, uh, it was, but it was apparently quite an important manor house. Uh, I'm struggling to find very much information about it other than the, uh, the sign that was on the fence just outside the property. Even English Heritage's website seems to deny all knowledge of this place, but uh, it's got their logo on it. <laughs> In fact, I had intended to come from over there, uh, which is just to the west of here, uh, by following the old railway which passes along there. I was following what appeared to be a permissive path. Uh, it may well have been up to a point, but before very long I came to private land keep out signs. So I tried to head in this direction. I could see this lump of masonry. Um, but when I got to the next gate, more private land keep out signs. So I had to take the long way round and come back through the center of Erton. Uh, but there it is, Manor Garth. This photograph shows the so-called permissive path that I was talking about that follows the course of the old railway. It starts about halfway along a road called Ratton Row and heads in a northwesterly direction, somewhat to the south and west of Seema. There was once a gatekeeper's cottage on Ratton Row, but unfortunately it has been demolished. Now the line of the track begins a long sweeping curve. Initially it heads southeast, then east, then northeast in preparation to join with the other railways at Seema Junction. In the process it passes under Seema Main Street, otherwise known as the B1261. What you are looking at here is the Seema Main Road Bridge. The Forge Valley line used to pass underneath this bridge. Unfortunately, from this angle, you can't see the arch. This was filmed from Pasture Lane to the east of the bridge, not far from the gatekeeper's cottage. This is the view from the bridge looking roughly west-northwest in the direction of Ratton Row. 
and this is the view in the other direction looking more or less east. If you look carefully you can just make out the gatekeeper's cottage a couple of fields away on pasture lane. To get to Pasture Lane Gatehouse and Crossing, you have to head north along Seema Main Street, back in the direction of Seema, then turn right on the Chu Lane, and then head in a generally southeasterly direction along Pasture Lane. And here we are at Pasture Lane Gatehouse, which seems in pretty good condition. Okay, behind me you can see Pasture Lane Keeper's Cottage. Pasture Lane is a fairly minor road now that heads out of uh, Seema south towards the railway, the main line from York to Scarborough, which is just over there, and also the A64 is over there. You may just possibly be able to hear it. Uh, but anyway, behind me is Pasture Lane Keeper's Cottage. Over there is where the railway line continues to, passing under a bridge on Main Street and in that direction is Seema Junction where it joins up with the York Scarborough line. This is the first crossing on the Forge Valley line after it leaves Seema Station and turns off at Seema Junction to head west. Uh, it's really only one field away from Seema Junction. To get to Seema Junction, head back the way you came up past your lane, keep going and then turn right onto the appropriately named Long Lane. Notice how Seema Junction isn't really that close to Seema at all. Just over there uh, is another crossing over the existing railway which is still running, that's the York to Scarborough route and I'm pretty much standing on where the old Forge Valley Railway line would have come off uh, and curves around in that direction to head west. Um, the uh, building behind me is called the Gatehouse, so that's a bit of a giveaway. And I suspect that driveway behind me is actually the course of the old railway. And here's that driveway, which I believe is the course of the line. Literally round the corner, and a little to the northeast, it's another building that looks vaguely railwayish. It's another gatehouse, and only a few hundred metres from the previous one. The unusual chimney is a dead giveaway. This is no longer on the Forge Valley line, since it's immediately next to a crossing over the York to Scarborough, and also the Scarborough to Hull route. Okay, just for the record, uh, this is the point where the line splits, um, to go uh, on that way, that heads off towards Bridlington, Filey and ultimately to Hull and on that side it goes to York via Moulton. Somewhere over there is the point where the Forge Valley line headed off to the west towards Pickering but uh, this is the point where everything splits. This, you could say, is the end of the line. Uh, the uh, Forge Valley Railway uh, joins the line which runs from York to Scarborough, which is immediately to my right, um, a few hundred metres up the track at Seema Junction. This is Seema Railway Station, which is still very much a railway station. Uh, it's an active one. Um, behind me, uh, you can see over here, that is the old station house. Uh, it's no longer in use with the railways, it's a private residence, but that's where it used to be. Um, the bridge, the road bridge you see above my head, uh, that used to be a railway crossing uh, before the bridge was built. Um, but this is no longer the case. If I move over this way slightly, you should be able to see uh, the station proper and uh, you can see the signal box. I believe there was another one at one time, but it's been demolished. Um, in fact, there were, yes, it was down at Seema Junction where the Forge Valley line branched off to head west. Um, but all of it is now controlled <coughs> from this signal box. 
I'm standing on the edge of the car park. There have been complaints about this, that there aren't enough spaces because uh, Station Road, which just uh, is in front of the old station house and heads up towards the right, um, they often get hundreds of cars parked all over the street and it annoys them a great deal. And this car park isn't that big, apparently. Uh, and it has caused a lot of problems. I don't know if anyone's doing anything about it. The local residents seem to think not. Let's take a closer look at the old station master's house. If you look at the car parked in front of this building and imagine it continuing in the direction it is pointing, then it would have passed over the old railway line crossing that was there before the road bridge was built. Originally, the ticket office was incorporated into the station master's house right by the level crossing. There is now no ticket office. In 1911, an additional track was added to the west in front of the station master's house. This was the so-called slow down line, down meaning away from Scarborough, and carried trains which would eventually branch off on the Forge Valley line heading for Pickering. A third platform was added for Forge Valley trains and this was reached from the existing island platform by means of a footbridge, although I'm not entirely sure of the exact layout. This is the original SEMA East signal box. There was apparently a second signal box right next to it known as SEMA West, but this was taken out of use in 1911 when a new signal box was built nearer to Seema Junction. Seema West signal box was eventually demolished in 1994. Seema is one of only four stations that remain on the York to Scarborough route, the others being York, Moulton and Scarborough. There used to be a great many more, but these were mostly closed to passengers other than for excursions in 1930. The other stations were Scarborough Lonsborough Road, Ganton, Weaverthorpe, Hesleton, Napton, Rillington, Hutton's Ambo, Crambeck, Castle Howard, Kirkham Abbey, Howsham, Barton Hill, Flaxton, Strensel, Strensel Holt, and Haxby. There are plans afoot, and have been since about the 1980s, to reopen Haxby Station since the population has grown a great deal in the area. Hopefully it will be open by 2024, but at the moment they're still talking about it. Pretty slow progress really, considering that the original railway line, all 42 miles of it, was built in slightly over a year. Well, that's pretty much all I've got. We could continue along the tracks of Scarborough, but that really is stretching the definition of the Forge Valley line a bit too far. So I'll say goodbye now. If you like the video, subscribe, like, whatever. Thanks. Bye. Just before I go, if you want to find out more about the Forge Valley Railway, I recommend the Forge Valley Railway website, which is excellent. Ian Smith has a video covering the Forge Valley station and area, amongst others. Disused railway stations is always good. Rail Map Online is very useful for finding old railways in the United Kingdom. Robin Lidster has written at least two books specifically on the Forge Valley railway line and a number of other railways in North Yorkshire. Thanks to Google for their Street View facility. Finally, thanks again to the Wycombe, Ruston and Northmore Village Archive for the photograph that shows the bridge over Ruston.